All right, thank you so much. It's a wonderful opportunity uh, to present at this conference. I would like to thank all organizers for that. And in my presentation, I would like to show our efforts on constructing a portable zero field device. And also we will talk about some exemplary spectra and as well as some exemplary applications of zero field spectroscopy for the purposes of analytical chemistry. Um, yeah, I think we are entering very interesting times where any development in this field can transition into very important applications. And I'd like to just say that zero field NMR is not a zero sum game. And by contributing and sharing ideas uh, in an open format, I think we all will move in a, in a very better, very good direction. So I was always uh, fascinated by the field of NMR and MRI, but obviously they have their challenges and problems. And one of those problems is portability. Usually uh, NMR scanners and MRI scanners are very big and it requires a lot of challenges uh, in terms of infrastructure, in, in terms of putting the spectrometers in place. What if they were portable? That would open applications in many areas of science, in many, in many areas of analytical chemistry. It would bring applications to developing countries. Another challenge is safety. Uh, NMR and MRI are not are known to be relatively dangerous. And all of these problems, both of these problems, are related to the strength of the magnetic field. Obviously, for conventional NMR and MRI, we need very high magnetic fields, and that determines uh, these challenges. So, what if one could do NMR and MRI without magnetic fields? And the whole uh, topic of this conference is this, zero-field NMR. And the answer is yes, it's possible to do it. But I just uh, wanted to quickly go through some basic um, ideas with respect to that for consistency, even though yesterday we've, uh, we've heard wonderful talks about this and how magnetometers work and about uh, sensitivity. So in conventional high field NMR, we have induction, inductive detection of nuclear spins, which means that we measure the magnetic flux that, uh, and according to Faraday law, it generates uh, basically the oscillating, oscillating magnetic flux will generate oscillating current in the coil that you use for detection. So because of that, in conventional NMR, where we just simply put the sample in high magnetic field and measure it, we have dependence of the signal uh, as a square of the magnetic field. So noise also can have its own dependence, but signal depends as a square of the magnetic field because you first need to pre-polarize your sample, and that's where uh, the first dependence comes from. And second, you detect it using inductive detection, and this is where the second uh, magnetic field comes from. So we have a square of the magnetic fields, which, which explains why it's very challenging usually to measure signals using this conventional method at low fields. And pretty much lower than Earth field is very challenging. And so in order to fix that problem, we would need to fix both of the issues. If we first would need to uh, be able to obtain high signal without magnetic fields, and second, we would need to detect this signal also without magnetic fields. So the first uh, approach is hyperpolarization. So we already know there are many techniques uh, that have been developed over the last decades, which can create extremely non-polarized, or as we call it, hyperpolarized nuclear spin state in which signal is high. And in some techniques, we don't even need magnetic fields to obtain the signal, in particular, parahydrogen induced polarization and its sister uh, variant uh, signal amplification by reversible exchange allow you to obtain high, very high magnetic field from the sample even without using extremely high magnetic fields. So I think we already can say with uh, pretty much that we solved the problem of high signal for this purpose. So can we actually use, don't use magnetic fields at all? And answer is, of course, yes. This is why we have this conference. And it was shown and pioneered by professors Alexander Pines and Dmitry Butker that indeed you can pretty much do NMR without magnetic fields. And here's the example of one of these applications where you use parahydrogen as a source of spin order and, uh, zero, uh, and optical magnetometry for detection. So in principle, you can say that in this case, you did not need pre-polarization magnetic field 
and therefore you have NMR completely without magnets. And which is really fascinating because now we realize this goal. So the question is, what can we do as chemists, because I'm a chemist, what can we do with this approach? Is it useful? Can it be used for any important chemical, analytical chemi chemistry applications? And uh, I think the barrier for entering this field for many chemists is the difficulty of constructing this uh, optical uh, sensing devices, which again, for experienced uh, physicists is not a problem. But for a chemist, it may be challenging to enter this field where we just simply want to measure signals and we don't really want to worry about the, uh, the setup. And remarkably, these days it's possible and this is how a chemist can now imagine simply speaking the sensor sensor which is optical magnetometer which is composed of vapor cell and some setup for measure to measure the uh, signal and to these days you can very easily purchase magnetometers like presented on this slide from the company q spin which has sensitivity of the order of 5 to 10 femtotesla per root hertz comparable to the uh, ho best home built devices and pretty much this field is developing is driven by um, magnetoencephalography but I speculate that the same devices can be used for chemistry purposes and maybe in future we will be able to actually do both magnetoencephalography and measuring signals from hyperpolarized chemicals at the same time so I want to point out that the first demonstration of the portable set up with uh, optically pumped magnetometer Q-spin was shown by Don Blanchard and uh, Dima Butker last year, this actual year, and where they demonstrated that indeed it's very easy to construct this device and um, use it for analytical chemistry. So here in my talk today, I want to just quickly show our effort in Berkeley that we have accomplished. And this is how our uh, portable zero field spectrometer looks like. It was built by uh, Piotr Foot, who was visiting Berkeley uh, this year. And I also invite you to visit his poster presentation in Twitter today. So Piotr did a, a wonderful job, and I want to explain what we have in our device. So pretty much, as usual, we have a pre-polarizing magnet for polarization. We have a shuttling system that will allow us to shuttle um, sample. And we do it simply by pneumatic shuttling. So we bring the sample up to the field by sucking the air, it gets pre-polarized, then we close the uh, flow of air and the sample comes back. And this is how it's located. So our Q-spin sensor is measuring the signals coming from the sample on the side. Let me actually just quickly turn it on. Laser pointer. Yeah, on the side. So if you're familiar with zero field NMR and detection techniques, there are actually many ways to generate uh, initial coherence and start observing nuclear spin signals. They include adiabatic transfer, where you turn off the field in the guiding solenoid very slowly, or it can be non-adiabatic transfer, where you bring your sample and you have a uh, field turned on in one of the coils in the ca carcass, and that coil then can be turned off very quickly and generate uh, this non-adiabatic non condition when the field is turned off faster than the corresponding uh, J coupling in the system. And in fact, actually, you can have many different arrangements, both adiabatic, non-adiabatic, both with pulse applied and no pulse applied, as well as transverse fields applied during the detection. And we usually do it by putting some field in the shimming coils. So this is the result that we uh, obtain typically with the formic acid. Formic acid is typically used in zero field NMR as a uh, number one molecule it gives a really large signal at the J coupling frequency of 222 hertz. And we can use it to uh, shim the spectrometer because, for example, if you have some residual fields, let's say in the transverse component, your um, peak will split. And by measuring the distance between these um, two formed peaks and plotting it as a function of the current in the shimming coil, you can actually find conditions in which your field uh, will be nullified, and that way you can obtain a nice single line in the spectrum. The same way you can do measure different pulses and calibrate pulses in your setup by uh, appropriately choosing geometry of guiding field uh, in, in the coil and the coil that is used for pulsing. 
So it's actually very easy. And again, uh, even chemists like myself uh, can do that now because we have a setup which we don't need to worry about in terms of optics. It's all built in place. So what do we see in zero field NMR? We usually interested in observing so-called J spectra. J spectra are important because they give information about chemical composition of the uh, sample. They basically, we can say that J spectra are fingerprints of molecules at zero field. And I'm personally interested in biochemical applications of NMR. And I heard a question today, where is zero field NMR can be advantages compared to high field NMR? In fact, methodological portfolio of tools potentially is not smaller in zero field NMR. It may be even higher because you have all the spins at the same time. You can also play with different pulses and adiabatic, non-adiabatic uh, variations of the magnetic field. But I think one of the main advantages of zero field NMR with optically pumped magnetometers is that you can build pretty much your own geometry of the sample. And you can study, for example, chemical reactors or biochemical reactors, which would otherwise be challenging to study by conventional techniques. And here I just show exemplary spectra of different biochemicals that we were able to measure. And yesterday or two days ago, Michael Taylor did a very great presentation about the dependence of um, J spectra on the magnetic field. But I wanted to look at this problem from a slightly different angle. Imagine that you have a two spin system and you use uh, during the detection, a transverse field of about 50 nanotesla. And this is how the spectra would look like uh, of a hypothetical two spin system if we increase J coupling from zero to some value here of about, uh, of about 20 hertz. So this geometry of the experiment is very simple in my opinion. It's just non adiabatic transfer of the sample in this transverse field, and immediately your spins will start precessing and they will start generating these types of signals, which in my opinion is very easy to rationalize. For example, the first spectrum corresponds to a condition where we have two spins without coupling, for example, water. In that case, you simply detect the signal at the Larmor frequency. So you generated your magnetization and it arrived non-adiabatically uh, to your um, sensing volume. And now you have transverse field and you simply have a precession of your spins. And you can now move this position of the signal by uh, choosing uh, the value for this transverse field. When we have more complicated system, which is the kind of limiting case here would be, for example, formic acid, where we have uh, Larmor frequency corresponding to the proton or H proton in the molecule. We also have another peak corresponding to average Larmor frequency of carbon and hydrogen in the molecule, as well as we have the peak uh, at J coupling, which is split by this magnetic field. So I think it's very easy to rationalize this type of spectra. And I want to point out that for analytical applications of zero field NMR, um, this region of zero, near low frequency peaks is also very informative. We always think in terms of J spectroscopy and it's great. However, I think thinking in terms of um, spectra at some elevated field is also very important because we can have still very useful chemical information with actually even higher sensitivity because sensitivity of these magnetometers is uh, strongest at very low, at, at lowest field. So what we did recently with Pyotr, we tried to investigate this simplest system, which was always used for NMR as zero field NMR purposes with, and re with the relaxometry. So we basically just measured how fast is the decay of each of these peak in, peaks in formic acid. And we found out the actually surprising uh, fact that these both peaks in the very low frequency regime corresponding to um, proton, free proton, as well as average uh, magnetization of basically magnetization at the average Larmor frequency for carbon and hydrogen, they decay with the same relaxation rate, which I think is relatively surprising if you used to think in terms of high field NMR. However, uh, peak near J is decaying slower, which is also understandable in this case because it corresponds to the single triplet coherence, which can survive for longer times. So this is just to show that even simplest systems in zero field NMR can have interesting, um, in, can bear interesting information. And look that here we can simply study different peaks and uh, study their behavior in a single spectrum, 
which uh, sometimes... Yeah, can, I quickly, it's um, can I quickly interrupt with a question from Michael? And I was wondering yeah. the same thing. What, mm -hmm. on, on this slide, what does the, um, what does, well, Michael says, what is the peak in gray slash black? Yeah, so gray, um, so we have this peak of, I, I'm just showing the formic acid sample. And uh, again, these are two peaks that we are looking at, and this is the third peak. So gray peak is a peak uh, corresponding to the hydrogen and carbon at the average Larmor frequency. And the red peak corresponds to proton OH, which we usually forget about. But in fact, it's still there and it can generate the signal. Yeah, I think it's actually very interesting uh, what we can see at zero field in MR, even with the simplest systems such as formic acid, which has been studied for a decade, I, I would say already. Uh, but even more interestingly, I think to study other biomolecules, and I was always fascinated by um, glucose, and in general, the ability to detect zero field or uh, spectra of glucose, or the ability to detect concentration of glucose non-invasively, I think is very, very uh, interesting option, and we investigated that, but in fact, if you really want to look at the J spectra and be able to measure J spectroscopy of glucose, let's say, in the blood, that would be a very challenging problem because concentration is low, and second, you have uh, low uh, natural uh, isotopic abundance. Therefore, this is probably impractical un to uh, detect glucose at uh, zero field conditions if you look at J spectra. However, we investigated the possibility of uh, measuring the glucose and uh, analyzing its concentration in aqueous solution by simply looking at the relaxation of water. So it's known that glucose is a very efficient and effective uh, assessed contrast agent, chemical exchange saturation transfer. Therefore, uh, chemical exchange can affect uh, properties of water and relaxation properties. And in fact, we indeed observed that if we measure and we change concentration of glucose in aqueous solutions, in a physiological regime of actually uh, up to 7, 10 millimolar, we see changes in uh, relaxation. So my question is, would this result be interesting in terms of development of uh, sensors for glucose? So I don't think the answer is easily yes. However, I think we should still all of us think in this direction because Indeed, what Zulf and MR allows us to do and what all these ideas that we have in this conference would allow us to do eventually is to measure NMR signals on a very small scale. And we know that there is a company, Theranos, that tried to uh, measure all sorts of metabolites from the uh, single droplet of blood, which eventually turned out to be uh, not feasible. And the company actually uh, did not have this technology, even though they promised I think that here with zero field NMR, we potentially may have this technology and we definitely should think further in terms of developing it. Because if you have a non-invasive detector of glucose, for example, you can just put your finger and uh, without any picking or taking the blood, you can estimate the uh, concentration of glucose in the blood. It would be a very, very big uh, game changer in the field of diabetes. diabetes. However, even if we're not able to do that, I think this actual idea of measuring chemistry from a single droplet of blood may be feasible if you combine both portable and uh, small scale detection as well as affordable hyperpolarization techniques such as, for example, provided by parahydrogen. And I want to quickly switch gears into other interesting, I think interesting uh, systems Yesterday, we've heard that quadrupolar nuclei should unlikely be detected at uh, zero field. And it's true, they're quadrupolar. They have usually very high relaxa uh, fast relaxation. And also, um, when we talk about quadrupolar nuclei, usually we think about solid state samples. However, in some cases, you can actually detect signals in J spectra from molecules featuring couplings to quadrupolar nuclei. So here we show the example of um, N14 labeled ammonium cation. And in, despite the fact that ammonium N14 is quadrupolar nucleus, um, because of the symmetry of the molecule, the, uh, we effectively switch off this interaction. And we have a unique system in which we have spin one 
that is still uh, observable at uh, zero field. And, and as a chemist, I always was thinking to how can we find a system which would allow us to tune these properties and investigate and study the effect of quadrupolar nucleus on the zero field spectra. And eventually it was clear that this ammonium cations are, is a good system for that. We can in fact prepare these ions by simply changing the proportion of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen and deuterium in our uh, aqueous solution by simply changing the proportion of H2O and D2O. And indeed, that provides us a very unique way of measuring and creating different isotopologues of these molecules. For example, if you take just a uh, totally uh, aqueous solution, you're going to have only this uh, cation. If you start increasing proportion of deuterium, you can actually select kind of like a, a slice of different concentrations. And in fact, indeed, we were able to observe zero field J spectra of molecules, all molecules in this uh, row basically, uh, showing that indeed, in this case, again, it's kind of like a cheating. De deuterium is not a really strong quadrupolar nucleus. It has a very small uh, electric um, quadrupolar moment, but however, we still are able to detect it. And I think it's very interesting because many biologically important molecules um, can also exchange hydrogen to deuterium, for example, amino groups and other groups. And we not necessarily should be afraid of it. I think in some cases it actually can provide useful uh, chemical information. And another point that we discovered about these systems, so these systems have several types of different uh, magnetic nuclei. So usually we we know that for in order to detect an MR spectrum, J spectrum at zero field, we need to have different source of nuclei, for example, hydrogen and carbon, hydrogen and nitrogen 15. So here we have three types of nuclear spins, and we observe very interesting phenomenon, in particular, a different dependence on the pulse length for different peaks in the spectrum. And I call it high frequency peaks as well and low frequency peaks. You can see that by changing the length of the pulse, we can actually change the appearance and at some pulse length we have nullified contribution for high frequency peaks and in some fields we nullified it for low frequency peaks and in fact this is a very interesting uh, observation because we now can use it to extract information about the system for example there is no way uh, to extract the value for hydrogen deuterium coupling in the system using conventional NMR. I mean, I may be wrong, but when I record the spectra at high field, they're still relatively broad and all the small couplings are not observed. However, at zero field NMR, we can plot the pulse length dependence of these two components of the spectrum and see which one of, and kind of simulate it for different values of J coupling, kind of. Uh, assume one and then simulate and see the um, pulse length dependence. And indeed, using that approach, we were able to find out that the J coupling between hydrogen and deuterium in the system is about 2.6 hertz. So I think it's another interesting uh, feature of zero field NMR that we can actually extract J couplings and as well as their signs from the uh, relatively simple experiments. And also for the purpose of, of analytical chemistry, it can endow and allow spectral editing where we, let's say we don't want to see some peaks in the spectrum and we want to maximize the contribution of others. So this approach can be used for this purpose. And maybe just to finish, I wanted to um, say about the contribution of chemical exchange to the, uh, to the zero field spectra. And in particular, very interesting observation that we uh, saw when you prepare solutions of ammonium cation at different pH levels, you can in fact very precisely tune and control the uh, rate of exchange in the system. And initially the thought was that high field and zero field NMR should um, kind of behave on the same scale of this uh, pH. For example, if we have high field NMR spectrum becoming a single line, it was expected that probably because all spins are coupled in the system, if you do the same at zero field, you will lose your signal, your J, spe J spectrum will gradually decay, but the thought was it would decay in the same pH scale, 
while in fact what we observed that signal is gone for pH about above zero already. So for this range, already zero field spectrum is gone. And it wasn't easy to understand what's going on initially. However, later we realized that the, uh, actually the reason is very simple. This is because during the shuttling, it's a small amount of time, about half a second, 0.3 seconds, but we basically, our sample already spans in a uh, regime which has lower magnetic field in which relaxation can be fast. So pretty much what's happening, if you have exchanging system and it exchanges to something that has very short relaxation rate, uh, a short relaxation time, even during the shuttling, you can lose your, um, lose your signal. And this should be taken into account when we don't see signals sometimes. This is either because chemical exchange or quadrupolar effects in these uh, systems. And yeah, once again, what other advantages of zero field? Will zero field ever replace high field NMR? I don't think so, but I do think that zero field can find really useful applications in the field of biochemistry, in particular for monitoring uh, interesting metabolically important processes, such as, for example, conversion of pyruvate into lactate. And uh, it was demonstrated not that long ago that indeed it's possible to observe with and detect with uh, optical magnetometers signals from pyruvic acid hyperpolarized by dissolution DNP. And the observation of this reaction, I think, is very crucial for the further development. And once again, as I said, zero field NMR is not a zero sum game. Whoever demonstrates these types of uh, important applications um, is very important for the whole community and the whole community will win from, from that. So in, at the end, I just want to say that the, my goal eventually is to make NMR really affordable. And I think the way to do it is to combine zero field NMR and hyperpolarization approaches for monitoring, well, let's say, biochemical transformations on the micro scale, for example, on the microfluidic chip. And yeah, we, I covered mostly what we do with optical magnetometers, but obviously NV centers and diamonds can be used as well as other hyperpolarization techniques such as dissolution dynamic nuclear polarization. And with that, I would like to thank all my uh, collaborators and especially professors uh, Alexander Pines and Dmitry Butker who pioneered this field and without whom uh, I would not be here talking to you. And just as a final note, I would like to say that I had a really kind of funny observation. So formic acid was, I may be wrong, but as far as I know, is one of the first molecules for which J spectrum was demonstrated. And in fact, you can take and process uh, Generate the sound for for this molecule. Let me see if you tell me if you can hear it. So yeah, this is actual FID of the J spectrum of formic acid with the real. You, you you hear it's relatively long because relaxation time is relatively long, and in fact it's very close to the uh, note A on the second octave. Uh, so I just want to point out that connection of music and frequencies and NMR was here for a long time. But in high field NMR, there is no absolute value, right? You can choose any frequency at which you want to detect your uh, signals. While in zero field NMR, we actually have absolute frequencies of molecules. So each sort of molecule, each type of molecule will uh, resonate with its own frequency. And I think this is really remarkable because now we actually look at absolute kind of musical notes and tones of uh, our uh, chemicals and zero field NMR is the sensor which is used for that. So with that, I would wanted to finish here. And James, maybe you said you have the uh, opportunity to, to show that indeed it sounds almost the same, right? I do, yeah, let me, I don't know, I have a piano in my palm and I can, I'll see if we can just uh, play that. Well, once again, this is how. <laughs> zero field NMR is not going to replace high field NMR. It's a huge developed subject with all sorts of amazing applications important in all areas of life. So I would still say that there is some interesting, um, so let me put it that way. In zero field NMR, I think that advantage 
of zero field NMR would come would come to fruition when we're not thinking in terms of measuring everything that is in the sample and trying to get an NMR spectrum, but rather if we're interested to look at the selected chemical and chemical transformations or some properties of that chemical in the system. And in that case, you can think of it as kind of lighting up the metabolic path pathway. For example, we can hyperpolarize one of the chemicals and look at the processes happening with them. I think Jay Kaplan can, the, Jay Kaplan's definitely can change in different solvents, even for the same molecules, they can change. And we will definitely see that in, uh, in J spectra. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we should always pay attention to exchange. As I already said, that chemical exchange in some solvents can lead to different effects and we should not uh, underestimate it. And maybe, yeah, one more time to, to say about kind of disadvantages of zero field NMR. There is still a lot of problems in terms of even analytical chemistry. For example, I didn't mention uh, signal of the chemical depends in zero field NMR. If we talk about J spectroscopy, not only on its concentration, but also on the spin topology of the molecule. So unfortunately, we cannot simply integrate and compare integrals of different chemicals without analyzing theoretically their intensity. I think it's a disadvantage. However, once you have tools which allow you to simulate spectra, you definitely can still uh, compare your concentrations.